Good morning. Welcome to everyone that braved the cold. I think after a hot day like yesterday, no one quite expected to wake up to this this morning. Um, it's also the first week of the schools, um, so I think all the, the kids should be back and going to their Sunday school in a moment, um, leaving us to have a sermon by ourselves. The order of the service is as follows this morning. Um, in a moment, uh, Steve, Ellen, and the, the band will lead us in, uh, with two more songs of praise, Unbroken <laughs> Praises and Jerusalem. And then Jean will uh, lead us in devotional prayer. And Anna Marie will do the Bible reading this morning. If I remember correctly from last week, she's got a sort of double take today um, with, uh, with the family news that Joma will, will, will lead um, and Anna Marie will have a, a role there as well. Um, and after family news, Joma will uh, be giving his sermon this morning. But before we start any of that, shall we open in prayer? Please bow your heads. <coughs> Dear God, at the start of the service, help us to recognize you above all else. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we might see you at work through our lives. Fill us with a desire to seek after you more than anything else in this world. Father, we need to hear from you. Let your spirit and power breathe in us, through us, again fresh and anew. Thank you that your presence goes with us and is our true and lasting strength, no matter what we're up against. We ask your peace, that your peace lead us, that it would guard our hearts and minds in you. Lord, be the center of our lives and help us to obey what we hear from you now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, church family. I want to just read you a short piece from Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the Almighty One. We know that you spoke to John in his day when the 21st century Christians were suffering terrible persecution and even death, as are many Christians around the world today. Lord, many will ask why. But we know the answer, Lord. It is so simple. It is the faith and the hope they and we have in your return. The time you will come to take us home, to raise us up to live with you in your heavenly kingdom, never to suffer pain, sorrow and afflictions ever again, but to live in glorious harmony and joy in your heavenly place with your people under your rule. Gracious Lord, how we thank you for your gospel, especially as we study this exciting book of revelations in our Bible studies. Give us discerning minds, strength, and open hearts to hold on to this faith and hope that you have promised all who believe in your word. O merciful Lord, have mercy on us. Wash away all our sins and cleanse our hearts and minds. Help us to honor your name and stay pure in your sight. We pray for all those who do not know you, Lord those that reject you, those that blaspheme in your name, and those who persecute your followers. We pray that we may be the light, that we may plant the seed that turns their hearts to you. We pray for our beautiful country, Lord, for all those who have no work, who are hungry and in ill health. We pray for those who have no homes, no parents or family. And we pray for those who are suffering from natural disasters, or man-made wars, and I pray especially for the children who cannot and have not the ability to withstand those who desert them, abuse them in every which way, and or murder them. Take care of them, Lord, and bring them home to you, where they will be loved and kept safe. 
Heavenly Father, we ask that you may soften the hearts and minds of those in authority, that they may see and hear the problems in their countries and do what is necessary to make people's lives easier and happier. May they see that war, corruption, greed and power struggles are sinful and a transgression of your laws. They chase after false gods and self-righteousness. You are a loving, merciful God, but you are also a wrathful God. I pray that you may use it in equal measure. Bless Christ Church Hillcrest and all those within our sister churches. Be with those in dire circumstances and ill health. Ease their paths, Lord, and give them the strength to overcome. Bless Jomo and his beloved family. Thank you for bringing him back to us safe and sound after his long sabbatical. We pray that it was a time of great blessing for him and that he may be refreshed to carry on the good work that he does. Clear our minds and hearts to receive his message and whatever it may be, may we hold it in our hearts and apply it in our lives. We ask and pray all these things in the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was and is and is still to come. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians, verses 1 to 17, and you can find it on your pew Bibles in page 1146. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sonthenesis, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all of those who in every place Call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. <clears throat> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Divisions in the Church I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This is the word of God. We continue with our series called Identity. So this is identity in Christ, and this identity in Christ needs to reflect in our daily lives. So this morning, we're really now moving from Um, Acts, which is where we were last Sunday, giving you a big overview, and we're starting with chapter 1. And in this chapter, Paul is really wanting to tackle a number of very difficult things. And I think my dear brother Paul must have prayed and thought about it long and hard, how to go about it, addressing these issues. And I think it will be good for us just to bow for a moment and to present our time again to the Lord. Father, we hear sermons Sunday by Sunday. 
We listen to them on YouTube during the week. We have various favorite preachers that we enjoy listening to. Bible scholars that we read their books, attend their conferences because we enjoy them. And so this morning again, as we are reminded by this passage, we pray that you would help us to keep the main thing, the main thing. That Christ is Lord to your glory. And we then seek to honor him, both with our lips and with our lives, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the Church of God, for many, many years, faced a real challenge. And that one of the challenges that the church faced is the problem of Christless Christianity. Uh, of course, uh, Michael Houghton is focusing on the American church, but the gathering of God's people around the preacher than Christ himself. Around the things we like than Christ himself. And Paul, when he wrote this letter, he had to tackle some of those problems in Corinth. There were challenges, there were squabbles, and the church was hugely divided, as you had Anna Marie reading that uh, passage. How do you deal with that in a, a church gathering? How do you deal with division? But proud people with squabbles in the church. Strong disagreements that sometimes move to, towards resentment. I really don't like that person. I wish he didn't come to Christ Church of Christ. And so you then end up with these groups of people uh, within the church of God where we have fellowship, but we have fellowship in groups. And how do you deal with squabbles? Even in a Bible study, in your own little group uh, of people studying or praying together or reading together. You know, we've got book clubs, Bible study clubs. There's so many of these groups out there. If the Lord had blessed you with the opportunity to lead one, how would you handle it? And Paul planted this church, as you know, has not been there for a while, gets a report that the church is hugely divided and the church is fighting over a number of things. Some like that one, some like that one, some like that one, some are fighting over the gifts of the Spirit. Some are fighting over the dress code in the church. Some are fighting over the language. So there's just so much that's happening. In fact, if you uh, read a little bit about church history, this was one of the most controversial of all churches in the early times of the church. Corinth was more controversial than Rome. <clears throat> and the reason that was the case was purely because it was so diverse culturally. And when you bring people of different cultures together and sometimes different races and class, there's always issues going on there. And there will be issues going on in the city. And if you have a church in the city and guess what? Those problems in the city, they find their way into the church. It's always the case, isn't it? Members were self-serving than serving Christ. They were divided, proud, rebellious, and honestly, sinful. And so Paul begins to then address the issue. And I love the way he goes about doing it. He's such a gracious man. And you read Galatians, you know he can really crack a whip. But here, he starts very graciously. 
he starts by reminding them who they are in Christ. In his greeting, basically he says to them, you are not prophets, teachers, evangelists. You are more than that. You are God's holy people, sanctified in Christ. That's who you are. You are a chosen and the holy church of God, a royal priesthood, a God's special possession. You, you are God's people. You have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. You've been set aside for what? For God's holy purposes. You no longer exist for yourselves, as it were, but for the Lord. In fact, as he says later, it's no longer you who lives, but Christ living in you. He starts by just saying to them, just guys, yes, I hear all the stuff that is happening. I hear all the struggle. And I think all of these are happening because you've forgotten who you are. And I, I come from a family that was very strong on that. Just, just, just remember the family name. Remember the family name. Wherever you go, it's not just about you. It's about family name. Growing up in a culture where you are just known as Mkunu's son, that's just about it. Wherever you go, you're doing something, and the parent looks at you and says, Huh? Isn't that Mkunu's son? Like, yeah, he is. And you just know you're in trouble because they're going to go to him and say, Really? Is this how you behave? And your dad will make sure you don't do it again. <laughs> and he says, we, we are God's holy people. Think about that. In every time when you come together as God's people like this, remember the first thing. You're not just Christ Church Hillcrest member. You are God's people. The people around that you maybe don't like that much. They are God's chosen people. Christ died for them just as he died for you. He's basically taking them down there. God's people. The church in Corinth is God's church, not Paul's church, not Apollo's church, not Cephas. By the way, Cephas there means Peter. Not Peter's church, Christ's church. For there is one Lord and one church of God. All right? You, you are sanctified in Christ. And then he says, called to be Christ's holy people, but you are called to be Christ's holy people together, not as individuals, but together as a church in Corinth. We are called together even here this morning. Together, not as individuals. He encourages this church to return to the holiness of the gospel. All right? That's the first thing, and it's all there in the introduction, reminding them who, who he is, basically why he has the authority to write the letter, and then who they are in Christ. And then he moves on to give thanks to the Lord. But he tells them that he is grateful to God for them. This is a very troubled church. A very divided church. A very self-serving church. And he says, I thank God. Let me rather read that verse exactly as it is. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Although you have so many problems, 
Although you are so divided, I am eternally grateful to God for you. For the grace of God can be found in that church in Corinth. God kept that church together. God continued to use that church to bring many other sons and daughters to glory. In other words, the, the gospel was still being proclaimed, even though the church was divided uh, based on some leaders, but the gospel was still being proclaimed and many people were still being saved. And Paul says, I am eternally grateful to God for that. My dear brother says, he reminds them of the gracious work that God has done in that church. God continues to do in that church and will always work with that church for as long as Christ is glorified. God in his grace has given them the gifts of speech and of knowledge. You notice that in verse 5? God has given them the gift of speech and the gift of knowledge. Speech referring to the, the gifts of prophecy and teaching and knowledge referring to the gifts of discernment and doctrine, biblical doctrine. And the church was very much blessed with these. And the people themselves had witnessed the power of the gospel in their midst. They've seen people being saved. They knew that Christ was working in that church. And he says, you are my witnesses. You know, he hadn't been there for a while, but he says, you've seen God at work there using your gifts. In a sense, he says to them, guys, you've heard the message of the gospel. You believed it. And then you took it to heart and you preached it. And you've seen other people receiving it and believing it. The gospel has the power to transform people's lives. And he will then say later, the same gospel has the power to unite divided people. All right. But he's still just working with them, getting them so that they're all together by the time he really begins to deal with the controversies that were taking place there. And he says to them, I am confident that the faithful God will sustain you all the way to the end. Your faith in Christ will last not because of your spiritual gifts, not because of your eloquent ability to present the gospel, not because of your natural wisdom, not because of your education, but because of the faithful God who will sustain you to the very, very end. Okay? God will sustain them. There are three things that I just want to uh, pick from this section and try and apply to us this morning. The first one is that we need to be reminded that Christ Church Hillcrest is God's church. It's not Caesar's church, rich church. It's not Glenn's church. It's not Jomo's church. It's not the council's church. It's God's church. Together when we meet like this and we glorify Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it's because God has rescued us. God has brought us together for a specific purpose and God expects us to fulfill that purpose. Right? We should no longer just live for ourselves, but for him who died for us. And seek to honor him with our lives as well as with our lips. That's number one. Christ church is God's church. Number two, your spiritual gifts are not just yours to brag about to show off, to tell people about. 
Whatever gift that God has given to you, it is for the good of his kingdom and for the benefit of his church. Whatever gift you believe God has entrusted to your care, that gift is for us to enjoy, not for you to save. So what is it that God has placed in your heart? What is the gift that God has given to you? What are you passionate about in life that you would want to do within the church family? So that we can help you and work with you so you can save in the kingdom. God has given all of us special gifts. But not all of us are willing to share those gifts with the rest of the church uh, family. And they, they don't have to be spiritual gifts in the sense of you, you need to preach here, you need to pray, or you need to read. There are many, many gifts that can serve the church. Anything and everything that can advance the cause of the gospel, we need to use it for his glory. God has blessed you with a gift. Use it to bless the church family and use it to bless people in the kingdom. Number three, in spite of all our struggles as a church, in spite of all your personal struggle as a Christian, here's the good news. The faithful God will sustain you to the very, very end. End. Sometimes it gets so hard. It's, life just becomes so difficult. And you try this, it doesn't work. You try that, it doesn't work. And you begin to wonder, where is God? How can he allow this to happen to me? Why is he not guiding me? Why is he not? You know, all the things that we sometimes begin to think in our minds. And here's the good news. The faithful God will sustain you to the very end. Yours and mine is to honestly seek to honor him with our lives and see him carrying us through. The challenge we face often is that we want God to serve us our particular agenda that is not his agenda. And so we say, God, we want you and we love you and we want you to do one, two, three, four, five for us. And God says, but you, you need to walk in my way. Yeah, 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 but after you've done this, then I'll consider your ways. And God says, no, no, it's my ways and then we, work, we may work your ways because if we don't walk in God's ways, we will always look after number one. You know, there are many things in life that are very difficult to do. And there's one thing we don't have to think about it is how to serve number one. Number one, just we serve number one effortlessly. You ever find yourselves in a situation where you know you shouldn't do that thing, but you really want to do it? And you know you shouldn't do it. Maybe even the doctor said, don't do it. And number one just says, just for the last time, just do it, just do it. Just, 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 just do it. And spoil yourself. Because number one always has a louder voice in our minds. Self-serving, self-serving. You know, you want to do this, God says do this, and number one says, no, don't do that, do that. Here, we need to remember, our God is faithful and will sustain us to the very end, but we need to obey him. All right? Now back to Paul's argument, because now in verses 10 to 17, he then begins to address the real problem. And from now on, he's going to be just tackling one after another of these challenges in Corinth. So he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you 
but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, many my brothers. Again, you notice the whole division is caused by people choosing different leaders. So you have got these factions, and then we see these uh, factions uh, openly in the political space where this group supports that leader and this group supports that leader and sometimes it even gets physical. And then where? Some promoted Paul. Paul. Paul is an apostle. Paul has a postdoctoral PhD in Old Testament. And Apollos, I mean Apollos, he had grade eight. Who would follow him? All right? And others are saying, yeah, but Apollos, listen to him when he speaks. He, is, he speaks with such eloquence. He's a brilliant man, yeah. Paul might have a PhD, but when you're listening to Paul, it's like you're chewing cardboards. What about Peter? Hey, you remember the guy who chopped the other guy's ear? He is brilliant, isn't he? He is a great leader. We like him. We support him. We follow him. And others say, ah, well, well, Paul, Peter, and um, Apollos, they're all just disciples of Christ. We are the main group. We are the disciples of Jesus Christ. And therefore, you listen to us, not those guys. Ain't it strange, isn't it? The whole thing just sounds so funny. But when you are in the thick of things, the debate, the argument could be so heated that people, real people, will be hurt. And I think maybe people like these different leaders because maybe they came to Christ through those people. I mean, in my heart, I have a very special place for a person who discipled me as a young Christian, because I was one of those people who just came to Christ through the tent ministry. And the people, the person who really worked with me uh, was the person I went to and said, hey, I, I just become a Christian. What does that look like? What must I do now? And that person then helped me. And I had a special, special place for that person in, in my heart. Sadly, really things didn't work out in, in, in his own faith, but still. He faithfully served the Lord as he discipled me and other young people at the time. And of course, we are to respect those people. We are to value them. I've got great Bible teachers. I've got great scholars that I really respect. And, and I have learned so much from them. I, mean, I value what they have contributed in the kingdom but never to the point where I would allow it to create divisions among us as pastors because we, 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 we enjoy different leaders and we read uh, different scholars because you know, we enjoy a particular group of people. The same with books. There are books that are read When there's a particular author, you write a book, and I want to read that book. Um, and there are scholars who read, write books that I would like to read, but often when I try, it just goes zoop, you know. So among those for me is um, a great scholar I really like to listen to, Don Carson. But I find when I read his books, they're pretty hard to read. But I enjoy him. And when I listen to him explain things because of his wisdom. So with all that, we, we value these leaders, we respect them, we honor them, and we are grateful to God for the work that they have done uh, for the kingdom. But here's the thing. The Corinthian church missed the point. Instead of focusing on the gospel, they focused on people. Instead of growing in the gospel, in Christ, they focus on growing the groups. 
Instead of wanting to create a fellowship of believers who are united in one purpose, they wanted to focus on their own group so that it becomes stronger than the other group within the church family. Instead of sowing unity, they sow division. So those are the things that Paul is really wanting to tackle here and to say, no, let's not go down that road. Now, I, I, look at it, the way he says, you are divided. Because some of you favor this leader, some favor that leader. Is Christ divided? See that? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or Apollos for that matter? Or Peter for that matter? You see, all the questions he's posing in this verse, they have one emphatic answer. No. Christ is not divided. And no one of these leaders was crucified for them. And the leaders themselves did not agree with them, the Corinthian church. And Paul is one of them. He's saying, no, 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 guys, we all came, we all preached the gospel, but we presented one and the same gospel. Don't get divided over us. Focus on Christ, our hope of glory. Christ is the center of everything. Christ is and must be the center that pulls all of us. When we gather together as God's people, Christ must be at the center always. As we read the word of God, the word of God points us to Christ. For he is our salvation. He is the supreme and the perfect sacrifice for all our sins. And the Corinthians church was missing this. He is the one who carried their sins on the shoulders. Not Paul, not Peter, not Apollos, but Christ himself. He is the one who suffered the wrath of God so that they may not have to face the wrath of God. And that is true today. Christ and Christ alone is the one who carried our sins to the cross. He is the one who died so that we may live forever with Christ, with God in heaven. Not our scholars. Not our leaders. He is the one who conquered death. And when we are baptized, we are baptized in his one and ho in his one holy name no other baptism we baptize people in the name of the father of the son and of the holy spirit never in the name of jomo glenn or anyone else for salvation comes through christ alone it is wonderful, isn't it? He's just reminding them of the basic, fundamental, biblical truth. You are all members of the same body. You are a family, and therefore I appeal for unity in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's Paul's appeal to the church. Now, how does that apply to us? At least ever since I've been here, I have never ever had any kind of division among the church people based on who they prefer, even the Bible study leaders, and you don't even have much choice because there's only one minister. So that's not our problem. But there are many things that still divide the church today. And there are many things that still divide Christ Church, Hillcrest. What are they? What are some of those things that divide us as a church? Family issues that the church has absolutely nothing to do with. You fight at home and suddenly the, the whole fight ends up in the church and some church members then side with that one and other church members side with that one and the whole thing becomes a real problem. 
And sometimes it's failed business deals. And I learned when I moved into the suburbs, there is an expression that says, don't do business with family members. Which was a total opposite from my culture. You, you want a business, just do it with family because you know they will always cover your back. But here, don't do business with family members because it creates all sorts of problems. Sometimes, as a church family, we guys have business deals that fail. And unfortunately, the business deal, when they fail out there, the consequences of it is that it actually creates tension and division within the church family. Because this one then tells that one that we had this deal and this deal didn't work and that one sides this uh, that one sides with that one. And the whole thing just grows and grows and it can really become ugly if it's not managed properly. We also have another division where people are very much self-serving. We come to church as consumers, but not really interested in other people's lives. We don't seek to know them, nor to have fellowship with them at all. We come, we meet our own little social group, we socialize, and we get in our cars, and we go. And we actually never, ever bother to get to know members of the body of Christ. Class. It's another one that makes us find it difficult sometimes to communicate with people of particular class or particular group. But all of these things, if we manage them well, because disagreements will always happen in a church family. It's impossible not to have those disagreements. Just like in your own nucleus family, you always have that. But if we seek unity, we will then seek reconciliation, isn't it? We would want to reconcile with that person. Like last week, I said, if you've done something wrong to one of the members in the fellowship, why don't you humble yourself and go to the person, admit, apologize, and seek to mend things? If we are one in Christ, Shouldn't we seek reconciliation and peace over proving that I'm right, you're wrong? Christ did an amazing thing. When he was literally being nailed to the cross, he prayed for the forgiveness of the people who were unrepentant and killing him. And so often I hear when I talk to church members and say, won't you consider to forgive the person? And the answer is often is, but he is not even repentant. And I am challenging you that we learn to forgive people even if they are not repentant of their sin. It is good for us. It is good for the gospel. It is good for the glory of God. And above all, it sets us free from bitterness. After church service, can you not try to initiate a conversation with someone you've seen for a long, long time, but you've never really gone to that person to say, hello, my name is Jomo. You don't have to say, oh, it's nice to meet you, you knew, because you know, they've been here for the last seven years. <laughs> You just say who you are and, um, and have a conversation. And I know that not all of us are conversation starters and some of us can't stop talking to, get the, to give the other people a chance to tell us who they are. Yeah. Wherever you are, but think about it. We're a church family. The divisions... Let's, let's just break down the walls. Not because there is hostility, just because we want unity. We want to know one another. We want to grow together as God's people. And can you think about now that COVID is slowly 
subsiding and uh, monkeypox is not a real problem. Consider to invite someone, uh, these days we have to say, for a bring and share because everything is so expensive. So when you think of inviting people, just think, oh, oh how am I going to fit them? Just to bring and share so that you get to know other people better. There is no greater way of getting to know other people than over the meal. Let's try it. COVID prevented us for two years, two and a half. Why don't we start now? In doing so, we'll get to know more people. All right? It's simple, isn't it? Corinthians is just saying, let's live out who we are in Christ. And being who we are in Christ is loving God's people, serving God's people, sharing with God's people. Let's pray together. Father, we pray for this unity. That it might not just be superficial unity, but genuine unity. Uh, just unity so that other people may, th may see that we are united. But because we are truly united in you. I pray for each and everyone in the church family, especially those who've really had some difficult disagreements. They know that the relationship is not working and they've almost given up on it. Would you please, Lord, heal the wounds and help the, them meet and reconcile for your glory's sake. Amen. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Amen. Amen.